All right, so I'm here with Celine de Cruz, who's an urban practitioner that works with poor communities on a global scale. Welcome, Celine. Perhaps you can begin by telling us a little bit about your organizations you're involved with and some of the work you do. Uh, I work for the Asian Coalition of Housing Rights, which is based in Thailand, but which is a network of different NGOs and community-based organizations in the region. But before that, I'm a founder member of the Slum Dwellers International and worked for many years in Bombay. And my life's work has been to build the capacities of poor communities to engage with their cities on issues of land, housing, and basic services, including their community spaces. So now it's been a little bit over a year since Habitat 3, where we agreed upon the new urban agenda, which you were very much involved in the, the lead up to that process and also that process as it came to fruition. Now we're shifting to the implementation side. Can you say a little bit about some of the challenges we'll face from an implementation perspective? From the perspective of poor communities, they have started implementing the new urban agenda since the last 15 years. It's the government who needs to get their act together and international organizations who have to get their act together. So, so basically communities have proved that they have the capacity to save to be able to leverage external finances for their own upgrading projects. They've been able to collect their own information and create their own databases. They've collected data citywide that the city doesn't have. So these are all assets for the city. So the city has to actually make use of these assets instead of treating them like a liability and also get its act together. Do you have some good examples where the communities have worked in close collaboration with the local governments to, to Oh, there forward. are many examples. There's a growing number of mayors who are beginning to see the advantage of working closely with poor communities because it's an area, it's not as if they don't like them, but they don't know where to begin. It's, it's alien stuff. Even, the, even a bureaucrat is not taught in his bureaucratic education on how to deal with the informal part of the city. So I think it's very important for poor communities, hence, to be proactive and engage their cities and help the cities to engage with them. And I think that's happening in many places. So for example, in the city of Jinja, the local government has worked very closely with poor communities. And now they actually have an urban poor forum where you have the private sector, government, and poor communities sitting together talking about city development strategies. Similarly, in the city of Phnom Penh, in, in many cities, in Myanmar, in many cities this is happening, even in Bombay. And it's interesting actually that you mentioned that uh, example from Jinja, Kampala, or Jinja Uganda, um, because that's an opportunity where we can take lessons learned there and scale them up. So it kind of also speaks to the fact that we have the new urban agenda as a guiding framework, but we have a lot that can happen at the grassroots level to feed into that and uh, can be shared globally. Um, perhaps you can tell me a little bit more about some of the public <laughs> space activities you've been involved in. So public space as a, it's been a new word, in a new vocabulary for us in the work that we've done because it's been land, housing, basic services. But a large portion of what poor communities have been doing is to build their community spaces. And a lot of that is small public spaces. So it's, there's been an interesting development of the idea of the small public space and community spaces because it's actually talking of dense communities which has very little space to play with. You don't have the luxury of having big parks. You don't have the luxury of the traditional definition of what a public space ought to be that can be translated in those communities. And so one needs to think creatively of how to create these small spaces, two benches at the corner of the street or just a little tree with, you know, with a little swing underneath for children to play. And these, these are the kind of things that make the mother secure because their children are close by, they don't have to go to a distance to play, and they can keep an eye on them. And yet, they are little breathing spaces because especially in, in poor communities where the housing situation is so cramped, that open space is a breath of fresh air. And it's very important, therefore, that it's safe, it's secure, especially for girls, for young children, so that they can go out there, spend their time, and come back to their homes. So one time you had mentioned, actually, it was during the discussion about how do we measure the implementation of the new urban agenda and the sustainable development goals, and public space was the topic we were discussing. And they were talking at the time the amount of green space in a city. And you raised the point that, well, public space is not always green. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? 
So if you look at the typical slum and 60% of our cities in the south are slums, there is no place to grow a tree because of the density, just sheer densities. The houses are so closely attached to each other and there is no pathway, there are no open spaces. So people may have a little pot in their house or a little plant, but it's very hard to go around telling people grow trees when they don't even have drinking water, right? So this has been a crisis and so you have activists going there saying grow trees. There's no water to drink for God's sake, how are we going to grow trees and water plants? So I think we need to redefine all these traditional ideas of what public space, green spaces mean in terms for, for different parts of the city. Especially if you are in the business of now trying to make cities inclusive and make sure that the informal and the formal city come together and we want to bridge that gap, we need to look at different kind of spaces. So we're at World Urban Forum 9 here in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, what are the key takeaways you expect to, to go home having, uh, having been agreed upon here at World Urban Forum? I would really like an emphasis to be on the small public space because I think that we need to define that properly. There needs to be clarity on the small public space or the community space because by just calling it public space, community, we need to make a connection between people and space. So you go to the city center and city bank or any of these people are ready to sponsor those kind of spaces. Nobody wants to sponsor a small tiny place in a dirty little slum in Dharavi, right? So that's, that's the shift we need to make in the way we evolve our definition of public space. Well, thank you very much, Celine de Cruz, and we wish you a very fruitful World Urban Forum. Thank you.